Hello and welcome back. My name is Carolyn Roth and thank you so much for joining us here once again. I'm really excited about this next interview and the next topic we're going to be talking about. This is about advancing the SDGs and how we do that, especially the financing bit post pandemic. That's going to be a monumental task for governments around the world. But I want to uh, reach out to Paolo Gentiloni, the Commissioner for the Economy at the European Commission, and see what he thinks about it. Commissioner, thank you so much for your time. No, thank you, and, and, and good morning, good afternoon. May I just uh, kick off with uh, just setting uh, the stage here, if you will, about where we are in Europe at this point? Because just recently, the European Commission has upgraded its forecast for uh, the European economy and, and its recovery post-pandemic. 4.3% uh, this year, 4.4% in 2022. That's the GDP growth that you're expecting. Again, that's an upward revision. And I'd like to know from you why this upward revision? Uh, well, indeed, it, it's, it's an upward revision. Uh, it reflects a, a certain degree of uh, uh, more optimism in our forecast. Uh, where it does come from? Well, I would say first, uh, vaccinations, of course. After a, a difficult uh, start, we have now with a uh, vaccination campaign very, campaign very effective uh, in all European countries. And we are quite uh, confident that we could reach the target of 70% uh, of the adult population vaccinated that we uh, were uh, um, targeting for the end of the summer, uh, also before this, already uh, probably in July. Second, we have good repercussion of a, a strong uh, relaunch of economic activity and global trade uh, among uh, more advanced and uh, uh, rich countries, um, especially US and, uh, and China. Uh, and thirdly, I would say our um, recovery and resilience uh, plans were factored in for the first time in this, uh, in this forecast. So all in all, uh, it's a good one. 4.4% uh, for the European Union is a, a significant figure of growth rate. Um, but the, the quality would be, of course, crucial. Absolutely. May I ask you, though, what are the risks to this forecast? Because obviously what a lot of people are worried about, economists, is, is the risk of inflation, maybe tapering happening sooner than expected, or rate rises happening uh, down the road, or new variants emerging. What do you currently foresee as the biggest risks? Uh, well, as you know, all these forecasts have normally uh, upside and downside risks. And uh, I have to say that it's the first time since one year that this uh, spring forecast uh, is quite balanced on upside and downside risk. Mm -hmm. In the previous one, the downside risks were, were clearly prevailing. Um, why I say uh, balanced? Because, yes, uh, we have um, upside risks. Um, the, the, the strength of the recovery could even grow. Um, it is not so clear the impact of the pent-up demand and of the large amount of savings, um, which we uh, didn't consider in, in its full strength. It could be even stronger. On the downside side, I think we have uh, at least two factors. One uh, is uh, the unknown evolution of variants and uh, um, end of the global vaccination that could have an impact. And second, as you were saying, um, inflation. Our estimate is that inflation will peak this year um, near 2% in the European Union, a little bit um, smaller in the euro area, but then uh, go uh, down next year. And this is broadly in line with the 
the forecast of the ECB and the, the huge majority of um, central banks uh, also outside the union. But of course, we should monitor this very closely. Commissioner, what's also kickstarting this recovery is obviously the unprecedented 750 billion recovery package that you have put together as the EU. It is so special because for the first time the EU can raise money on its own on the markets and also because you hope to make this recovery more sustainable. Tell us how exactly you plan to do that. Well, uh, indeed, I think it's a very interesting day to um, to have a remark on this because we uh, reached exactly yesterday uh, the final uh, ratification uh, process of the decision that allows the Commission to go in financial markets. So this was uh, yesterday, and I think that since today we are ready, and uh, this is good. Uh, and second, we are now received 19 out of 27 national recovery plans, and um, we are very, very intensively working on, on them. What is important here, I think, is that uh, the, the European recovery package is not only, and I would say not mainly, an emergency response. Emergency responses were given uh, also thanks to decision taken by the Commission in March 2020 and by the ECB in March 2020 at national level and with very strong and fast reactions from member states. Now, uh, in the uh, beginning uh, from uh, July with the first disbursement, uh, so in the second half of this year, we will have this common uh, um, initiative issued through common debt for a common purpose and, uh, a, as you were saying, concentrated on some um, strategic goals, the green and the digital transition, first of all. And this is absolutely crucial because we are not looking for a rebound uh, because well, a rebound could practically um, already um, uh, be considered to be there. Um, with our uh, growth rate projects, we are more or less uh, uh, back to the uh, level of growth uh, pre-pandemic. What we are looking for is a more stable and sustainable level of growth in the Union for the years to come, maybe not at 4.4%, but higher and especially of better quality than the one that we had before the crisis. This is the real target of this common initiative. And I think it's quite uh, um, interesting and even fascinating to work on this. If we will be able to do this, I think we will have in a few years a better European economy, not only an economy back to the level of growth pre-pandemic. That's the hope, definitely. But Commissioner, I do need to point out the big predicament that many countries around the world find themselves in, especially the poorest economies of this world. Because of the pandemic, the fiscal response to prop up the economy and, and to support health services, that was extremely expensive. And that put a further squeeze on the, the budget, really, to fight things like poverty and to advance SDGs. On top of that, we see that many economies around the world are heavily indebted. What do you expect the EU to do about this? What's the plan here? And what are you hoping to see from the G20? Uh, well, I think um, something, some decision were already taken from the G20, uh, but there is much more to do. And uh, if I should uh, single out one particular issue, I would say that this particular issue would be uh, health policies. And, the, <clears throat> and this <clears throat> now means uh, vaccines. Um, 
I just uh, uh, had a conversation with the, the, the G7 finance ministers and uh, uh, Kristalina Georgieva was stressing the importance of uh, the health policy as the key uh, element of uh, our economic policy at a global level. So we have uh, increased our commitment on this. I really commend the uh, G20 presidency uh, that with the European Commission last week organized this global health summit um, and there were uh, pledges for uh, vaccination in uh, low-income countries um, beginning from 100,000 um, uh, from sorry 100 million doses and uh, I think this effort could be strengthened. Then we have the more uh, financial dimension of this effort. But I repeat, the health policy one is now the most important. Uh, we have to reach uh, at least 40% of the adult population uh, at the global level vaccinated uh, by the end of this year. And we are still far from this uh, goal. And now we are beginning to, and we had difficulties also because the COVAX initiative mainly uh, based on the uh, serum Indian uh, uh, production of vaccines, which is now constantly in, in India. Uh, and so we have to uh, commit ourselves in Europe, uh, in the United States, and in advanced economy, first of all, on health policy and vaccine. Then we have uh, initiatives in the financial sectors. I am quite satisfied of the decisions taken on the suspension of the uh, debt services of low-income countries, uh, which is now in uh, almost 50 uh, countries. Uh, we also uh, reached an agreement on a, a global a framework uh, to deal with the debt, try to involve all uh, different countries and private public creditors in a uh, single framework to address the problem of the debt. Um, and finally, uh, we decided this uh, new uh, uh, amount of drawing right for, for the uh, IMF and here the discussion that we will have beginning in the G7 next week in London will be how do we use these new funds for the IMF. Mm. These should be funds targeted especially to a more indebted and low income emerging Commissioner, I want to thank you so much for those thoughts, for those insights. We wish you the best of luck uh, during those very critical conversations that you'll be having with colleagues uh, at the G7 in London next week. And obviously, the commitment to COVAX will be absolutely key in uh, the fight against the pandemic and, of course, indebtedness going forward. Commissioner Gentiloni, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We want to discuss this further, uh, the question of what to do about global indebtedness, the debt levels, solutions to it, and how to finance the SDGs further. I've got with me on this panel, a great panel, Homi Karas, the Director of Global Economy and Development at the Brookings Institution. We've also got Stefano Mansevisi, Scientific Advisor at the IAI, the Instituto Affari Internazionali. Sorry, my Italian isn't the best. And Muriel Pinico, permanent representative of France to the OECD, and last but not least, Vera Songway, Undersecretary General of the United Nations and Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time. All right, let's, let's kick things off because I just want to read out a very alarming fact from a recent publication uh, by Homi, actually. Uh, you will recognize this, of course. The IMF and its World Economic Outlook predicts that Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East will each have negative net financial flows in 2021. 
Um, Homie, talk to us about how dire the situation in a historical context. Well, I think that, uh, you know, we have a, a number of overlapping uh, issues. First of all, obviously, uh, with the uh, pandemic, uh, there is a real urgency to get uh, resources for spending, not just to deal with the uh, immediate issues of uh, health and uh, recovery of these uh, economies, but also for the kinds of transformations that are uh, required. Uh, in particular, the transformation to a green economy. And uh, you heard uh, Mr. Gentiloni talk about the uh, large European package to affect that transformation. Well, that same kind of thing has to happen in every country across the world. But what we're finding is that in many developing economies, especially in Africa and uh, Latin America and some other places, instead of the financing flowing into these economies to help them do that, they're having to actually repay old debt and finances flowing out. I mean, economists have been calling this the uphill flow of finance. To be honest, it's been happening for quite some time. And what we haven't got is, as yet, real structural reforms in the financial system to actually be able to reverse that. Mm. So whether it's banks or the official lending agencies of bilateral governments, many of these are actually retrenching and getting their money back from developing countries at the very time that developing countries actually need more. Mm. So I think that this is a, uh, a problem and uh, there are many things that we could be doing to try to uh, uh, solve that uh, problem. Uh, it's a problem not just of the uh, short-term financing, but how do we put in place financing structures which will help us achieve the kind of financing over a 10 or 15 year time frame that will be required to move towards the SDGs. Hmm. Uh, and I hope that in this crisis, that's something that we'll start to talk about. Hmm. Uh, Stefano, let me throw in another factor that really exacerbates the crisis that the poorest nations are in right now. Because, you know, as Homie has pointed out, in, in his research, they're facing a development crisis, balance of payment crisis, a debt crisis. But what if inflation in the U.S. rises too fast, the Fed will have to raise rates too quickly? That means uh, there's going to be a capital flight for many emerging nations. That means that, you know, the debt payments are only going to, to increase. How much of a risk is that? Well, I think, uh, I think that uh, certainly there is um, high risk in quantitative terms, but uh, I would like, uh, uh, because in these days we speak all a lot about uh, quantity of monies which are necessary in, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, what is recovered in uh, delaying or in abandoning the payment of the debt service and how much money is injected through uh, the international uh, financial architecture. And I fully subscribe to what Homi said in the sense of uh, there are some changes which are, which are necessary. But I think that in particular, in view of uh, the, I mean, in the scale of the challenge, in view of the fact that uh, uh, in particular, the poorest countries are confronted with urgencies like vaccines and health reforms, but uh, these are to be addressed uh, uh, with the capacity of setting up long-term policies, you know, not only a, a sort of emergency, continuous emergency approach. I think that uh, it would be advisable to go back for a second to what are the fundamentals of the Agenda 2030. And the, and the fundamental number one is starting from uh, sound policies, not immediately with money, sound policies and reforms. Because the principle of the policy first, I think it plays uh, in, in a, a, a very important role in, in these days in order not only to talk about how much money everybody is doing, and obviously a lot of money is needed, and also the way in which it is uh, injected, uh, but also the way in which, uh, you know, the reforms and the policy indicators are, are defined. So in other terms, in order to counter uh, uh, all the risks or the major part of risk and to use uh, the money which is uh, coming from external finance but also which is leveraged inside, I think that we have to pay attention a bit more about the effectiveness of the spending through SDG-based budgetary cycle, if I may say so, which uh, must be based on drivers in which uh, uh, investments and uh, domestic finance are, are concentrated. I think that from this point of view, something on which uh, 
it is not uh, it is not discussed uh, i mean in my view sufficiently is the necessity of be equipped in knowledge in data you know the last world bank report as uh, and rightly so put the accent on the necessity of investing on data data is not just collecting information data is also the the result of a way to of knowing and planning it's uh, it requires uh, the setting up of uh, let's say of tracking mechanism so i mean all this uh, is not uh, very much uh, in the under under the spotlight but for once uh, i would like to underline when we talk about uh, how to uh, let's say ensure financing of the sdg to talk not only about the quantity of money is necessary but also how effectively this money is spent and spent and i think that is particularly important because in fact in particular in developing countries the poorest countries knowledge for tracking and for monitoring is particularly weak right. and therefore i think that investing in data investing in the new tracking mechanism investing in the new metrics is also extremely important mm. and the second point is just not only the effectiveness in the medium and long term through a policy planning a budgetary planning and drivers like green economy and digital and health but also the second element is the governance system you know it is because you know you can't put a lot of money into a system which is not transparent which is not accountable which is not using money in order to reform for example taxation system in order to leverage what is the d- domestic uh, the domestic resources if you are not investing in uh, measures combating fr- frauds and corruption you know if you don't invest in a social pact hmm. which in other terms is putting together uh, citizens uh, people and institutions you know this uh, will never be uh, able to turn uh, uh, let's say the present crisis into something in which will bring uh, sustainable reforms and changes to make uh, let's say the new policy planning sustainable right. over time so not to deviate the point from the emergency and just diluting it but simply to say the emergency start also in dealing with the effectiveness of what uh, uh, the countries are doing and the governance through which they are doing and there are a lot of things mm-hmm. that we can uh, we can discuss about this mm-hmm. uh, including the level the right level of governance you know which is not only central government but also cities mm-hmm. so therefore the, right. the the mechanic is this you know money yes but the effectiveness data metrics uh, and tracking and second the transparency and the credibility of the system in which this money is put mm. Uh, Stefano, you raise a, a lot of very important points. I want to switch over to Muriel and see what your suggestion is of, of what should be done now. Is it simply um, a matter of coming up with a new Brady plan, if you will, like we saw in the late 80s, the early 90s of uh, debt restructuring? How exactly should it work to, to, to alleviate this problem for the poorest nations? First, um, we should not... Uh consider the situation separating the economic and the debt question from the social part. It looks obvious to say that, but all are the mechanism are sometimes related, not always systematically integrated. Why I say that uh, OECD countries na- right now are, sp- are spending uh, uh, 14 trillion USD to boost their national economy, and not only short term, as a uh, uh, in the European or the French uh, plan, uh, there are a lot to invest in uh, digital, in green economy. So it's a crisis answer, but also an investment in the future. And in the poorest country, in the developing country, it's seven times less. And the gap is increasing right now because of the crisis. But the, the, behind these figures, there are a lot of situations where very damageable on the long term, on the social part. And it's not only a question for emergency, of course, it's emergency for mm-hmm. the, the uh, vaccine and medical equipment and the uh, COVAX initiative is central to this. But I would like just to put some f- zoom on some focus on some topic. First, the people in risk of starvation uh, are, with the crisis is doubling from uh, 135 million to 275 mi- million. So that's the first thing. The school Investing in education is probably the most important thing with the health to, do, to help the country to develop. And today in uh, developed countries, uh, kids have lost in average six weeks of school uh, since more than one year. It's four to six months in developing countries. So in a lot of kids are just 
dropping out of school. Right. And that could be a sacrificed generation that never come to qualify job and cannot uh, be part of the future economy. Hmm. Um, from the poverty standpoint, uh, the, and from the, the, the impact on poverty is estimated now to more than 100, new, 100 million new, new people that are entering extreme poverty. And that can uh, create a, a lack of cohesion in the society. Um, social crisis lead also to political crisis. And another example on, uh, on jobs. Uh, according to ILO, it's almost 300 million people that have gone to inactivity because of the crisis, the COVID crisis. Mm. But a lot of others also were in the informal jobs, mainly women. Mm. And they have lost the informal jobs. Right. They, they have lost their income. And today it's clear at OECD, at the World Bank, mm -hmm. at ILO, that women and young people are the ones suffering the most. So mm -hmm. it's not only a question of emergency. We need to invest uh, on the uh, tax capacity to sure. uh, get resources in countries uh, to the, help them to not be tomorrow late in the green change. Mm -hmm. uh, to the governance, but also to invest in human capital, mm -hmm. because without the human capital, they will not be able to recover and to continue to grow tomorrow. Uh, Maria, thank you so much for that. Vera, I want to bring you in here because what we heard from Commissioner Gentiloni was quite interesting. He said at the heart of the response to those indebted nations should be the health response, uh, ramping up COVAX, ramping up the vaccination rate. What do you think? Um, do African nations need more? Do, do they need more vaccinations or do they need debt restructuring or both at the same time? What's the most pressing issue? Thanks for having me. I think um, um, two, two, two things. Um, first of all, to open any of our economies, we need vaccines. And uh, as, as he said, uh, just to give you a sense of the numbers and following up a little bit from uh, Muriel, um, today we have about 27, uh, I would say 28 million uh, people on the continent, a continent of 1.3 billion, of course, we have about 28 million people that have been vaccinated. Uh, when you look at the global community, it's about 1.7 billion. So while on the continent, it's two for every 100. Uh, outside the continent, it's 21 for every 100. So clearly, we are 10 times behind on, 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 on the vaccinations. And that's the most important in terms of reopening our economies. However, with the COVID crisis, where we have now been in it for a year and a half, uh, we heard, uh, 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 you know, the commissioner tell us that, you know, with the $750 billion that the EU has gotten, we are now looking at how we get out of it. And the good news for the EU today is that they have market access. They can go back to the markets and they can raise additional resources. When the crisis hit, the African finance minister said Africa needed $100 billion to get out of the crisis. That was... Uh, you know, compared to the $14 trillion that the developed community gave itself, this was 2% of, of Africa's GDP. We have not been able to get that. So I think it, for Africa, the, the response has been enormously slow. We've gotten, as uh, the commissioner said, the DSSI. The DSSI gave to the African uh, countries uh, $5 billion in terms of debt suspension in, 2000, in 2020. It's going to give us another four billion in 2021, but that's clearly not enough. Mm. Uh, we've gotten the G20 uh, debt framework, uh, which is another conversation that's ongoing, but no country has been able to fully understand. And part of that is because we need to recapitalize the multi uh, multilateral development banks to ensure that when countries actually get into a debt restructuring conversation, there is a guarantee that there will be additional resources on the other side of, of the, the table. The uh, special drawing rights, the SDRs, uh, have been allocated to the global community, $650 billion of special drawing rights. All of Africa gets $33.6 billion because it's done on a quarter basis. So this is the Africa that only got 2% of additional response, getting 5% of the SDRs. The G7 gets about 42% of the SDRs. So what we are asking for is an on-lending of the SDRs into three facilities. First of all, a facility for low-income countries to help them get access to quick liquidity to continue growing. Secondly, vaccines, 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 vaccines. A lot of Africa's health security and actually economic security 
was, as you say, in the hands of COVAX, which is in the hands of Serum Institute. Because the Serum Institute cannot deliver vaccines, we do not have vaccines on the continent. So we are talking about manufacturing more vaccines on the continent, but also that countries that have already uh, been able to vaccinate 54, 60% of their populations should on lend, not even give for free, but on lend those vaccines to the African continent. Africa is willing to buy the vaccines. This is one case where we actually have resources, but we can afford the vaccines. Mm. So we'd like to do that. And then finally, 75% of Africa's GDP is made out of countries that are low middle income or middle income economies. They have not gotten any support from this crisis. They need market access, just like Europe is celebrating today market access. Those countries need market access. But what we need is to take away what we call the liquidity premium from the cost of market access for those countries so that they can go to the market and get additional resources to be able to begin to respond uh, to this crisis. And so we're also asking that we use some of the SDRs to facilitate, just like Europe has decided with the European Central Bank to facilitate Europe's access to markets, because we know that our central bank budgets and our fiscal budgets cannot continue to underwrite mm. uh, fiscal stimuluses. There's no resources. Markets are the only option. For emerging market economies, we need to take away the liquidity premium and ensure uh, that we can go to the markets. The Economic Commission for Africa, along with African finance ministers, is asking that we do this for, for the continent. Mm. Thank you. Um, Homie, let me get back to you, because it seems like from the conversations also with the commissioner, a lot has been done by the official institutions like the IMF, like the World Bank during the crisis to help out the poorest of all nations, the, the ones that are most indebted. The private sector, though, has been standing back and they've left the scene. Often what we've seen in past debt restructurings, uh, they haven't taken a haircut as big as the effect official sector has. So what's the role of the private sector going to be this time around? Should it be more involved? Will it be? Well, let me say that um, I think the international community has uh, provided uh, quite considerable support for uh, many low-income countries. But as uh, Vera said, uh, the bulk of the developing world today is in a uh, category uh, that the World Bank calls, uh, you know, lower middle income or uh, upper middle income uh, countries. And these middle income countries have actually uh, received uh, uh, very little uh, official support. And when we talk about, you know, much of the debt service issues that are coming down the pike, it's not so much just the will countries be able to service their debt right now, it's at what price. And that's what Vera was kind of harping on. It's that in a world where we have today uh, almost zero uh, real interest rates that the private sector is prepared to uh, uh, lend to the European Union or to the United States or to uh, Japan, they're charging a very high liquidity premium to developing countries. Now, there is a, uh, uh, a claim that this high risk premium that they charge is because of a risk of default that they might not get paid back by developing countries. But the historical reality is that the private sector has not really suffered major losses on their loans to developing countries. In fact, they've made quite substantial profits out of it. So when you say, you know, what will happen? My suspicion is they will continue to try to make substantial profits out of developing countries by continuing the system that we have today, which is right now a system where they have not participated in the debt service suspension initiative. Uh, in some, for some countries, there are conversations about participating in the common framework for uh, uh, debt resolutions, but as yet, we haven't seen a, uh, a, a true uh, uh, finalization of any of those kinds of agreements. I don't see from a short-term perspective a realistic uh, uh, sense that the private sector, the existing private, the, the, the private sector will uh, voluntarily move mm. to uh, uh, providing the kind of uh, debt reduction 
that official creditors may be willing to do, mm. because the the private creditors don't get the same kind of benefits that official creditors get. Right. Official creditors get benefits because at the end of the day, they believe that a world where we have a certain degree of stability and where all countries benefit, benefits everyone. Right. And it benefits their countries as well mm. as benefiting the uh, recipient countries. Mm. Mm. Uh, and that's sure. the kind of world they're trying to uh, create. Hmm. So I think that realistically, even though we might say we would like the private sector to contribute more, realistically, they're unlikely to uh, do so. And that the uh, bulk of the uh, response has to come from the uh, uh, from the official side. And let hmm. me say, I don't believe that that is terribly expensive hmm. in you know, real dollar terms, and right. certainly not when stacked up against the $14 trillion that you mentioned are being spent on uh, recovery in advanced economies. Uh, sure. Muria, agree or disagree? Uh, a little of both. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is, uh, first, um, the I think most of the country in the EU and OECD uh, have been able to protect their ODE budget, which is not obvious. Uh, for instance, in France, it's even increased, and we are planning to commit to a uh, higher level. But um, I'm, I'm sure I'm, uh, that uh, we should do our best efforts to also increase the private sector contribution to financing the sustainable development. I, I agree with uh, uh, Homi that it's not always spontaneous. So the question is how we can uh, create a framework which is attractive to, for that. And because it means both attracting investors, but also developing trade, as uh, Vera mentioned. Mm. And for that, I think we, we, we should work on an innovative framework to help companies uh, that wish to invest more in development. Uh, green bonds, in a way, have led the way, have a show pass, and probably development obligation could be uh, interesting to could have a future. I, I, we need to, to design instruments that make it uh, sustainable and make it uh, attractive. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, I think we need to have a comprehensive view. Uh, as uh, Stefano mentioned, uh, the question of uh, helping countries to better mobilize their uh, fiscal resources is key, uh, because otherwise without M. Mm -hmm. And uh, the same thing, what you all mentioned on, on the, the debt service, and I think uh, what have is done uh, in the framework of G20 and Paris, uh, club, it's already a uh, first step, which is interesting, is important. Mm -hmm. But to be everything, to keep everything on the shoulders of the governments uh, and the international solidarity of governments, I think uh, it's, a, um, it's a way where we'll be not, not sufficient and in private sector bring right. something else. So I think we, we need to work as a coalition of private public on this topic. Um, we only have we a few more in, too optimistic. Uh, we, we only have a few minutes left, but I do want to bring in an audience question, which is directed uh, to Vera. Uh, rather than restructuring debts and increasing aids to the continent, don't you think reforming international financial governance and international trade policies to be more inclusive and fair, especially to African countries, push Africans uh, master the potentials of their fiscal space to better address their local problems? Vera. No, thank you, thank you. I think very quickly, I think that just helps me to rebound a little bit on uh, Muriel's uh, answer, which is we need to be innovative, but also we need to afford for uh, in emerging market economies and African economies what we have afforded for developed economies. In the developed economies, I talked about this liquidity premium issue, which makes it very expensive. Even if we go and get green bonds, we're paying too much. We can redesign institutions so that these middle-income countries on the continent can go to the market at the same rates like the advanced economies and generate more resources. It's called the liquidity and sustainability for the green bonds facility. And we hope that the international community, I think for once, we are asking, let's level the playing field. Let's treat emerging and frontier market. $150 billion of Africa's economy and the debt we're talking about is in the euro bond market. You know, but we need to make sure that when we access the euro bond market, we access it like Greece and Italy and France without this liquidity premium because we haven't created an institution. So no, we don't want handouts. We want the right institutions to allow us to become fully playing market uh, 
uh, agents. And I think we can do that with this crisis. If not now, then when? Yeah. Uh, Vera, uh, now we've got some final thoughts for you, Stefano. We've got about three minutes left. Some final thoughts from you based on well, what you heard. No, well, I think, I think that, you know, if, if I may say, uh, solidarity is not only in, in paying money, in uh, giving vaccine, is also sharing risks. And this is precisely the way in which, uh, you know, I think we can bridge precisely this sort of gap which exists in market access in terms of affordability to go on the market. Mm -hmm. And here, you know, I think that uh, to create a sort of uh, division of labor between what is the, the, the classic ODA, what is the uh, concessional financing, what is the private financing, uh, I mean, uh, acquire a, a specific importance, but uh, on the driving seat uh, should be the countries. And therefore, the reason why I insisted on the fact that the policy planning and the budgetary planning, which are leveraging more domestic resources, which are creating conditions for inflows of a private uh, in investment, the architecture through which external resources, including ODA, is used in a different and more creative way, for example, covering risk and de-risking what are the investments from private sector. I think all this requires, you know, also a quite sophisticated governance. The reason why I'm insisting on the fact that, you know, it is important to talk about more money. It is, it is important to talk about how to make this money available, actually, because there is a lot of money now. There is a lot of liquidity. But the problem is that it's not available for those which are more in need. Uh, and this is a market failure, or to say a market risk, but second also um, a question of uh, difficulty in, in planning, in a, in a credible planning, in a transparency management. So, you know, the alternative, you ask at a certain moment, the alternative whether it's directed to finance vaccines or to, or, to, or to cancel debt. I think that it must be cancelled, the debt, in order to allow countries to, to produce and buy by themselves, I mean, vaccines. At the same time, you know, so this is a bit of the delicate mechanism that we have to put together. The reason why the governance issue, the transparency, and the trust between people and, uh, and institutions in this very moment is part of the solution of the equation. There is not only money, there is also the way in which it's used, the governance, the transparency, and the effectiveness of this money. Mm. Stefano, I want to thank you so much. I also want to thank Vera, Muriel, and Homi. Thank you, everyone, for your insights. Uh, extremely important discussion, uh, one that will have to be continued um, on many stages around this world, and hopefully uh, we will be able to help those indebted nations. Thank you so much. My name is Carolyn Roth. See you, everyone, soon. Bye-bye.